Good evening. Welcome to the 2023 Doug Walker Lecture. Uh, my name is Maya Tolstoy, and I am honored to be the Maggie Walker Dean of the College of the Environment. At the University of Washington, we acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land that touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. The purpose of this event is to celebrate the outstanding and vital work that Doug Walker spotlighted, including what it means to fully embrace our natural world. While I never had the chance to meet Doug, it's clear from the wonderful stories I've heard that he was a remarkable person who cared deeply about human connection to nature. Doug had a zest for life, and he believed in making the outdoors accessible to all, no matter one's background or circumstances. Tonight, we honor that enthusiasm and dedication. I'm incredibly grateful to Maggie Walker for being a champion for the College of the Environment. Maggie has been with the college since the early days of 2009, and I have been the beneficiary of her insight, mentorship, and guidance over the past year and a half as in my tenure as dean. And this past June, Governor Jay Inslee announced the appointment of Maggie Walker to the UW Board of Regents. Congratulations, Maggie. I'm very excited about the topic of this year's lecture, Building Resilience, Future Forward Solutions for Nature, Health, and the Urban Environment. At the college, we spend a lot of time thinking about and developing solutions for a vibrant and thriving future. Every day, our scientists, researchers, and students dedicate themselves to addressing one of humanity's most significant threats, climate change. And the college is up to this incredible task. We are unlike any other institution in the world with unparalleled scope and depth in diverse subject areas, including atmospheric sciences, oceanography, earth sciences, ecology, fisheries sciences, and marine biology, forest sciences, and environmental social sciences and policy. Our students, faculty, staff, and postdoctoral scholars are among the foremost on the planet enabling us to serve as a global hub for innovative research and excellence in teaching. As a part of our community, I hope you take incredible pride in the work happening right here in our own backyard and around the world. As you know, events like this rely on commitment from our community. And I want to say a big thank you to our founding sponsor, REI Cooperative Action Fund, Thank you also to the Washington Trails Association and the Wilderness Society. We are grateful for your partnership. Our next speaker is Professor Greg Bretman, Doug Walker Endowed Professor within the College of the Environment. Greg is the Director of the Environment and Wellbeing Lab as well as UW Nature and Health. He teaches course on these topic, courses on these topics, as well as outdoor recreation management and sustainability in society. Greg works at the nexus of psychology, ecology, and public health. He's authored many interdisciplinary studies on the ways in which natural experience impacts well-being, and he collaborates on the formulation of frameworks and tools that put this evidence into practice for decision makers and urban planners, especially in the context of addressing health inequities. Now please help me to welcome Professor Greg Bratman. Thank you, Maya. Uh, good evening, welcome to all. Uh, my name is Greg Bratman, and I'm deeply honored to hold the title of Doug Walker Endowed Professor. As Maggie, Maya, and I discuss the topic for this year's lecture and how it would be compelling and relevant to our work at the College of the Environment, we kept coming back to this theme of envisioning a world that is centered around resiliency and the ways in which nature can be incorporated into that concept. A theme emerged around urban resilience, the ability of a city's businesses, institutions, communities, and individuals to endure, adapt, and flourish. And talking about the environment and climate change can often bring a sense of grief 
or hopelessness. But it's also possible to focus on specific dimensions of hope and to search for real and pragmatic solutions that address problems in a focused and effective way. From the stories I've heard about Doug, this was his ethos as well. Sometimes these solutions are massive, other times they may seem small in scope at first, but together they have the potential to contribute to substantial and positive change in the face of the massive environmental challenges we face as a global community. Heather Tallis is a scholar whose work is directed toward this change. I've known Heather for many years, and I have seen her excel and inspire others in so many different contexts, from academic settings to NGOs, public policy, community partnerships, and others. And throughout all of these roles, she's demonstrated a commitment to construct and implement pathways through which nature can provide solutions to a vast array of challenges. Heather is an excellent scientist and communicator. She consistently figures out new and innovative ways to make a positive impact on our ever-changing world, and it's an honor to have her join us here tonight. As another powerful example of an individual who makes a positive impact, as I was preparing to arrive here as a professor at UW, one of the first names I heard was Maggie Walker, and I very quickly and soon learned why. Maggie, a graduate of UW, is a fierce advocate for the university, and we are fortunate to have her as a champion for the College of the Environment. She's a conservationist and philanthropist and works tirelessly in the community on issues she cares deeply about. Personally, I'm very grateful to Maggie, who's been generous with her time and insight as I navigated my own transition to Seattle. Maggie currently serves at the helm of the Walker Family Foundation. She's the founding board chair of Friends of the Seattle Waterfront and the retired chair of the National Audubon Society. She's worked closely with the College of the Environment over the past decade, chairing the advisory board and representing the college as a member of the UW Foundation Board. Her philanthropic support includes the Maggie Walker Deanship, the Doug Walker Endowed Professorship, and the establishment of this lecture. Maggie's impact spans the nation, where she has devoted decades of her life to supporting philanthropic causes. The Walker family's contributions have left an indelible mark on the University of Washington and communities far beyond our walls. Thank you, Maggie. As a quick note on our format for tonight, the keynote lecture will be roughly 40 minutes, followed by a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. And we have two microphones available for audience use during the Q&A. One microphone is on a stand at the front. Um, you can simply walk up and ask your question. For those who may have difficulty getting to the mic stand, please just raise your hand and a staff member will bring the second microphone to you. Uh, please do hold your questions until the Q&A begins. And now please join me in welcoming Maggie Walker to the stage. Boy, I'm not as tall as the rest of these people are, so. So, um, uh, forgive me, I am in recovery from uh, a very bad bug, which I think was RSV, that my two and a half year old grandson gave me about a month ago. And I'm still, I still have a cough. I'm not contagious. I've been tested multiple times for all kinds of things. And, uh, but if I break up coughing, please don't panic. I'll, I'll, I'll recover. Um, so good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here in this space, which feels so comfortable um, for us all to have a conversation about a, a subject I think that most of us care deeply about in this community. Thank you, Greg, for those incredibly kind words. Um, you know, as I've turned 70, I've had to look backwards at my life and evaluate, um, you know, what have you accomplished? You know, what have you done? for the benefit of all. Um, and my involvement with the College of the Environment is what I consider one of my great, um, not accomplishments, one of my great engagements 
um, and it's just a powerful affirmation of who we are here in Seattle and in this region. So um, this evening you're going to hear from Heather Tallis, who is interesting to me for two important reasons. One, she's a UW alum. She's uh, got her PhD here at UW in biology, and she's really interested in finding and defining a more rational relationship between humankind and the natural world. We as a species are struggling right at this moment to assert a different way of viewing the role humans play in the natural order of things. I think we're all kind of struggling with this, right? And we need to acknowledge both the many benefits we derive from, but also the many harms that we do by our use of resources on the system that spawned us. We need to remember that again. I would also like to acknowledge this evening um, Maya Tolstoy, who is our relatively new Dean of the College of the Environment, who has been quietly mobilizing the formidable energies and assets at the University of Washington to tackle the issue of climate. There is little doubt that UW is poised to become a global leader in climate research and solutions, both scientific and social. I am incredibly proud to have my name associated with her work, as I am to have Doug's name associated with Greg's. Now let me introduce you now, um, so that you can hear from Heather, uh, Dr. Tallis is the Assistant Director for Biodiversity and Conservation Sciences at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I think Sally, Jewel, actually took me to visit that, that office. Sally, didn't you do that? Yes, at some point you took me into the White House and it's such a funny little, anyway. She, um, <laughs> it's a rabbit warren. It's very interesting. You know, you go into the most powerful place in the world and it, it's uh, amazingly kind of homey. Um, she has deep experience advancing science and policy that bridges nature, the economy, and people's lives. As Greg mentioned, she leads cross-agency action on nature-based solutions, advances efforts to account for nature in cost-benefit analyses, and with the U.S. Global Change Research Program established the National Nature, Natural, uh, nature Assessment. So we need this expertise at the federal level now more than ever, I think, as we all realize. And through her previous work with the Nature Conservancy and the Natural Capital Project, Heather has used the tools of science, human-centered design, and innovation to infuse nature into decisions for local communities, governments, and the private sector around the globe. She has brought biodiversity and conservation expertise to the World Economic Forum, the U.S. National Climate Assessment, and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, and that must be an amazing acronym. <laughs> Um, Heather also serves as a visiting professor at the University of California Berkeley School of Public Health. So as you can see, this is a, a, a person whose work crosses many boundaries. And, and frankly, in order to find the solutions we need, that's what we have to do. So welcome, Heather. Thank you for being here tonight to give the Doug Walker Lecture. Thank you very much, Maggie, for that very kind introduction. It's a true honor to be with you all this evening. I appreciate the UW College of the Environment for the invitation, and I appreciate you all coming out on a Wednesday night to spend some time with me to talk a bit about nature and health and cities. Um, you heard that I do have a role in the White House right now. I want to just emphasize I'm not representing the federal government tonight. <laughs> I'm going to share with you my personal views. And just to emphasize that, I'm going to start with a personal story. This is a story about an experience that I had that really first opened my eyes to the intense connection that there can be between nature and our own health. This is a sp story about me in the lower right-hand corner, but also mostly about my husband, who's in the left middle bottom. Um, and this is from 2001, so that's a pretty old picture now. And this was from a time when we had a bit of a gap before we started our graduate research here at the University of Washington. 
and we were traveling in Southeast Asia and had the opportunity to volunteer with the Earth Island Institute and Sahabat Alam Malaysia, which is a local NGO in Malaysian Borneo. They were working with many indigenous groups who at that time and still today um, were fighting against legal and illegal deforestation uh, that was threatening their forest territories and their livelihoods. And we had some of the skills that they needed to be able to document what they already knew about their boundaries and about their dependence and reliance on the forest um, in a way that they could use to negotiate with the government. So we were lucky to be there at that time, and uh, we uh, dove in to work with a Penan community. Some of the members are here in this picture. And uh, launched off, and what that looked like on a day-to-day -day basis was us splitting up into two teams. I would go with one and my husband with another. And we would walk straight compass line transects through the tropical rainforest, which I do not recommend. <laughs> This was not on trails. This is on very steep slopes and dense underbrush, and it's very muddy and hot and sweaty and buggy and prickly in a lot of ways, and uh, amazing to be able to walk through these places and experience the really deep knowledge and relationship that that community had with the plants and trees that live there. And this all went very well for about a week and a half, and then we had an incident I had come back um, with my team for the day, back to the community in the village, and I was down uh, on the edge of the river there, um, washing up from the mud and the sweat in the forest uh, with my translator. And the headman of the community came down to the river's edge and started washing a root. And I thought this was a little odd because I hadn't seen any of the men in the community cooking or preparing anything, and so I wasn't sure what he was doing. And so I asked my translator, you know, what's he doing? And she asked him, and he calmly answered, and she calmly translated to me, Joshua's been bitten by a snake. I was not calm. <laughs> um, this was one of the sort of most intense things we imagined could possibly happen while we were there. There are some very venomous snakes there, and we were three days by boat away from the nearest hospital. So we knew if anything did happen, our options were pretty limited. And so I uncalmly ran up to the headman's house where Joshua was to see how he was doing and to try and learn more. And this is how I found him. He was conscious and alert, and I was happy. Um, <clears throat> and I asked him, you know, do you know what it was and how bad it is? And he said, it was a pit viper. <laughs> Not good. And, and he said, I, you know, uh, I asked uh, the, the community members that were with me, you know, what they know about the snake. And his translator, who was from the community, had said, oh, I've been bitten by that one. If you're okay in an hour, you'll be fine. <laughs> so we knew at least what we were looking at and uh, what we had ahead of us. And we also uh, quickly learned that this was not a new situation for them. And they, in fact, had a plant that they commonly used to treat this kind of a snake bite. And so they had already gathered this plant's leaves and made a poultice and put it on his arm over the bite. And what the headman had been doing was washing the root of that plant to prepare a tea, which he drank cup after cup after cup of, while we watched and waited with the rest of the community uh, to see how it was going to go. He uh, felt the pain in his arm from the venom at the site of the bite, and it was slowly moving up his arm. We imagined if it got past his shoulder and into his heart, that probably would not be good. And so we watched, and we waited, and it moved up his arm to his elbow and to his bicep, and he drank tea, and we watched, and we waited, and it moved to his shoulder, and then very luckily, it stopped. And he's fine, <laughs> still alive, uh, <laughs> and in that day, nature you know, almost took my husband's life and then gave it back to him. And to me, that was a very visceral uh, uh, opportunity to appreciate just how dependent our health can be on nature. Obviously, we don't here live in a Bornean tropical rainforest, but there are um, many ways that our life is connected to the natural environment, and that experience really inspired me to learn more about that, to more deeply understand how our lives are connected to the environment and how we can strengthen those connections and protect them um, for our own benefit. So that's what I wanna talk more about today is some of the science that's emerged over the last couple of decades that's given us more of an understanding of what some of the connections are between nature and our health, 
our happiness, our intelligence, and our safety. And then I want to switch and talk some about the solutions that are being um, uh, identified and moved forward that can really help us intentionally bring those benefits into our communities uh, for our own health and resilience. So I'm going to start with safety, since we started with an unsafe story. Um, and we have uh, uh, an increasing intensity of risks that I'm sure you're all very aware of uh, that are affecting each of us more and more commonly. We very often hear about those risks as being driven by climate change, and many of them are. However, in most cases, they're also being driven by nature loss. And it's a combination of those two things acting together that's introducing the level of risk that we're facing now from many factors. So I want to give just one example from fire. I know you all have experienced this very likely and increasingly intensively in the last few years. Um, wildfire is certainly increasing uh, in intensity and in frequency uh, in many parts of the world. This is, of course, in part due to decreasing rainfall or changing rainfall patterns, increasing temperatures, and other aspects of climate change that are increasing the conditions for massive wildfire. But that's happening on top of a couple of centuries of fire suppression and unhealthy forests and grasslands where fuel loads have built up due to the way that we've managed these systems. So we basically have tinder boxes sitting there under the conditions that are emerging under climate change. And these two things acting together are really what's driving the intensifications that we're seeing. This, of course, increases the direct risk to our lives from being in the path of potential fires, but the smoke is also dramatically increasing our risk of respiratory diseases. This has been well known for quite a long time, but what's emerging more and more now is just how significant that signal of wildfire smoke is in our overall air quality. So just in the United States, a study came out this year that showed that we now have an identifiable signal annually of wildfire smoke in our overall air quality in three quarters of the states in the lower 48. And in the western United States, where wildfires are really the most intense now, this has actually reversed the trend of increasing air quality that we've seen since the Clean Air Act was passed in 1970. So this is now a really significant part of the challenge that we have to address for air quality. This, of course, is not just happening in the United States, and I want to mention one other major fire event to just emphasize the global scale of this challenge. Many of you probably heard about the major fire season in Australia in 2020. That fire was so intensified and localized um, that there were major smoke plumes that were um, formed, and they went higher into the atmosphere than usual. And black carbon from those fires was traced all the way across the South Pacific Ocean to Buenos Aires in Chile. And it didn't stop there. It kept going all the way around the entire globe and back to Australia. So this is a really significant scale of effect that we're seeing now. And those plumes also went higher up into the atmosphere than usual and interacted in a way that actually reversed the progress that we've been seeing in the closing of the ozone hole. That one fire event undid about three to five years of progress of improvement in the ozone hole um, because of the chemistry that happened from the smoke. And of course, the ozone protects us from solar radiation, and this opens up another couple of pathways for possible health effects from those fires, exposure to things like skin cancer and cataracts. So this is gloomy, I'm sorry. Um, but because uh, the decline in nature is an important part of these signals, that means that an improvement in the environment can help reduce these risks. And there's a very clear set of examples that have been developed over many years now where managing that fuel load that I was talking about, returning forests and grasslands to a healthier state, can significantly reduce the risks of extreme catastrophic wildfires. So the US Forest Service and many other groups have been implementing fuel treatment programs like prescribed burns that are low level controlled burns that clear out some of that fuel. Uh, and this has been shown now to be very effective in uh, reducing the intensity of fires enough so that they can be suppressed and controlled. This is an example of a picture of where this was implemented in a fire in Arizona in 2011. The yellow band outlined there is an area where the Forest Service had previously treated the fire, uh, the uh, forest, and returned some of its health. So a fire did start and come raging over this ridge that you can see, burning very intensively and moving very fast. And when the fire moved into that treated zone, 
the flames dropped down from about 120 feet to about 20 feet, and the fire slowed significantly, and so firefighters were able to suppress it and keep it out of the rural residential area that had been in its path. So these types of approaches have been implemented really broadly now in some cases, and the Forest Service reports that over 700 fires now on public lands have encountered these treatment areas and been reduced enough for suppression efforts to be improved. So some really clear evidence that taking these kinds of approaches well outside of cities, well outside our urban boundaries, can really help improve the resilience of our urban conditions and reduce some major risks to health. Thanks. <laughs> so this is just one, of course, of the intensifying risks that we're seeing from climate change. I want to mention just a couple more where there's a clear intersection between climate change and nature loss, which means there's a clear opportunity for reducing risks through management of the environment. We see similar intensification of floods, um, sometimes now multiple times in the same place uh, over and over in intense situations. These floods are, of course, in part due to increased precipitation patterns, increased intensity of storms in certain places, but the amount that that rainfall or those storm waves cause damage also has to do with what's going on on the ground and in the water when that storm hits. In places where we have maintained wetlands that can act as sponges and absorbent soils that can infiltrate some of that rainwater, um, and where we've maintained uh, dunes and marshes along our shorelines, um, the impacts of those storms can be lessened. Nature can ask, act as a buffer against these floodwaters and absorb some of them, not all of them, but some. In places where we've replaced that absorbent and buffering nature with concrete and cement and hardened surfaces, the water all stays above the surface, runs off, and turns into flood water. So this is another case where managing for nature inside cities and around cities could really literally dampen some of the effects of climate risks that are emerging. The last example I want to give is around heat stress. We all just lived through the hottest August on record globally. Some of us felt that a lot more intensively than others um, in places where there were really extreme and extended heat waves. Again, this is, of course, in part due to climate change and the global changes in temperature that we're seeing as a result. But how we experience in that on the ground in our communities, again, has a lot to do with what we've built and what we're surrounded by where we live. When natural vegetation and perhaps green roofs are in place, there can be some absorption of that heat, some shading, and some cooling that can lessen the effects of those heat waves and protect some of us from heat stress. In places where we have a lot of, again, uh, hardened, built, uh, and, and dark-colored infrastructure, um, that intensifies and amplifies the effect of those heat waves, making it an even harder, harder for us to tolerate the changes that climate change is driving. So the main point here is we see uh, multiple risks emerging and intensifying. Many of them can be abated, buffered, and reduced by investing in nature in cities and around cities. I want to switch now to emerging research that we're seeing that shows us that nature uh, can affect our brains directly and uh, literally make us smarter. I really like this one because it means like three points on a math test. <laughs> So I want to give an example of some excellent research. I'm taking a big risk here because I'm going to talk about research by Professor Bratman, who happens to be in the room. <laughs> so if you have any questions about it, I will defer them to him. <laughs> but I do think this is very compelling research, and so I wanted to highlight it. Um, some of Greg's work was done while we were both uh, at Stanford University, and he was able to demonstrate that even relatively short walks in nature can improve cognitive function. So we had students in an experiment, some of whom walked at the dish. If you've ever been to Stanford, this is a beautiful natural area that's an oak grassland. And other people walked down El Camino Real, which if you've ever been to Stanford, <laughs> is a bustling, busy main uh, city street right through the middle of town. And these students took the same cognitive function tests before they took these walks and then after. And those who walked in the natural area showed improved cognitive function. They did better on visual and verbal working memory tests, and they had more focused attention. So some very direct evidence here that something about even brief time in nature is directly affecting our brains in ways that affect our ability to think. There's some interesting research that's come out of Australia that suggests we might need even less of a dose of nature to get a brain boost. 
In this case, researchers gave a 40-second micro break to people doing cognitive function tests. Some of them saw a view on their screen, not even out a window, of concrete roofs. And some people saw a picture on their screen of green roofs with vegetation and flowers and plants. Those who saw the concrete roofs actually did worse after their break. Their concentration fell off and their errors increased. Those who saw, again, 40 seconds of a screensaver that looked like nature, their concentration increased and their performance stayed stable. So a really interesting to me set of results that suggests uh, something in our brain is really triggered and heightened uh, by the opportunity to have even a brief exposure to nature. Of course, our brains uh, have a lot to do with our intellect, but they also have a lot to do with how we feel, our mental health. And so there's been additional research exploring whether and how time in nature affects our mental health. I want to share just a little bit of that with you. I'm going to go back to Dr. Bratman because he didn't stop at the math tests. He kept going and asked questions about mental health. And people, again, who had the opportunity to walk on the dish in the natural environment reported having less anxiety after that walk, reported lower rumination, which is that negative, self-repetitive, beating yourself up in your head. Uh, and they reported a more positive affect or a better mood. So in addition to these cognitive functional results, uh, some signals that uh, mental health was improved. And again, Greg didn't stop there. He went ahead and mapped their brain function with MRIs just to double check if these results were really robust. And they, in fact, saw a different pattern in brain function, again, just after a 50 or a 90-minute walk in a natural area with less activity in the part of the brain that's responsible for that rumination pattern and other mental health effects. Very compelling to me to suggest that we really should take those walks in nature. An additional study uh, was able to draw from uh, a lot of the information that was gathered dur the, during the COVID-19 pandemic and has now linked in London access to parks to less mental distress. This to me is a fascinating study. They used big data from cell phone location information for over 2 million Londoners. This is a map of London. And what that uh, travel data showed them is that people who lived near the parks in the green areas visited parks more often during the pandemic lockdowns than they did beforehand. And those in the blue areas, generally farther away from parks, visited parks less, likely to do to their restricted uh, mobility. But then they went one step further and said, OK, did this access to parks affect their mental health? And they had the opportunity to use an existing representative cohort study on mental health that had started before the pandemic for 5,000 of these people. And for those people who did live closer to green space, they saw less experience of mental distress during the lockdown periods. So again, some clear evidence um, from robust mental health studies that having access to nature during the COVID crisis um, really helped decrease stress. Many of you might have felt this yourself, and now there's data here in this case backing it up. The last connections I want to mention are around some more connections to physical health. Many of you have probably heard that being near parks or having access to parks does tend to increase people's physical activity, and that exercising outside can have literally more physical benefits than exercising inside. So I want to mention a couple of other effects that you might not have heard as much about. This is one of my favorite studies, an early one, that looked at around 1,700 patients who were admitted to a Boston area hospital for stroke. Those people were followed after they were released from the hospital. And because of their discharge records, these researchers knew where they went home. And they could look at the greenness of the neighborhood that they returned home to. And they asked if going home to a greener neighborhood helped people survive longer after their stroke. So what you see here is survival over time with people surviving less the longer the study went on. But you do see the top line there that neighborhoods with more green space, people generally surviving longer. And the people with the least green space generally surviving less long. By the end of this 12-year study, if you went home to a green neighborhood, you had a 1 in 10 better chance of still being alive than if you went home to a less green neighborhood. Or as a friend of mine once summarized this study, plant trees or die. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I don't mean to make light, light of this. this is a very serious um, set of outcomes and emphasizes that people don't have equal access to green space, whether it's parks or greenness in their neighborhoods. And then that has real health effects, which means variation in nature in our cities can lead to health inequities. This is something that we've heard about much more for a long time in the context of pollution. We know that there's variation in where air and water and soil pollution happens and that it tends to stack up in the urban environment on certain communities. Um, sometimes not by accident, sometimes due to direct racism and redlining and other aspects of development that have piled up these intense concentrations of environmental health risks on some communities. And so this is now a generally understood pattern in the public health world. And this is a map from the Washington State Department of Health that for the entire state um, shows uh, what they produce as an environmental health disparities index. It stacks up these environmental pollution factors with social vulnerability information and identifies places where people are at the highest risks of environmental pollution affecting their health. So with this zoom in on Seattle, you can see in the dark purple areas, the places that are under the greatest risk. And to me, these are places where health inequities can be overcome by creating a cleaner natural environment. So these are some of the ways that science is showing us there are real identifiable and understandable connections between nature and our health. And I wanna shift now to what we do with that information and how we take what we know about these connections and literally build them into our cities so that we can intentionally have healthier and more resilient communities. Several of the options that I've talked about already are broadly referred to now as nature-based solutions. This is a term that's getting a lot more recognition and a lot more wide use, so I thought I'd introduce it to you, not because I like jargon, but because hopefully you might hear about these things and now know um, what this is referring to. In general, these are broadly investments in nature that benefit both people and the environment. So that's a very broad sweep of things, um, but a, a, a useful framework for us to think about in terms of how we can build and bring nature into cities. Just as an example, uh, additional green space that uses native species and provides habitat for biodiversity is providing a benefit to nature and people have access to it and the kinds of benefits that we've been talking about is providing a benefit to people. If you put a scrubber on a smokestack that reduces air quality, that's an important solution that benefits both nature and people, but it's not a nature-based solution because it's not an investment in nature. So just to clarify, I'm not preferencing these solutions, just describing them as part of what we have in our toolbox. So these solutions are getting a lot of attention and a lot of support globally. Um, groups like IUCN and the US Army Corps of Engineers have developed standards and guidelines so that people can consistently and effectively design nature-based solutions and build them into our, our built infrastructure systems. And I'm uh, very happy to share that I was lucky to be part of the White House releasing last year a national roadmap for accelerating adoption of nature-based solutions, just signaling a real clear interest and intention um, for the federal government to be doing much more to bring these solutions to bear for communities. I wanna talk now about just a few more of these solutions and the avenues that we have uh, to work with cities and with the private sector to bring them into our living environments. So a very basic and probably very well-known nature-based solution is protecting nature, just keeping nature where it is, uh, in parks, in our cities, and outside of them. When we can keep nature in its fully functioning condition as we find it, that's our best bet for getting the full set of benefits that nature can provide. And we should continue to uh, increase and expand on uh, the, the strong basis of parks that we have in our cities today. There are many ways that we can do this, uh, advocating with city planning departments, mayors, state, city, and national parks departments who all have mechanisms and opportunities to grow the footprint of parks and build out more of a base of nature in our communities. But now I wanna to switch to something you may think less about as a literal avenue in for nature, which is transportation corridors. These are our walking and biking paths, our roadways, our railways, and our ports. All of these can be built with more elements of nature uh, as part of them. Many of these transportation corridors have easements along them, have land footprints, 
that are managed to improve their resilience and protect them from things like erosion and flooding and heat. And nature can provide some of those benefits if habitat is restored and built alongside our infrastructure. This is a fascinating uh, option to me because these infrastructure corridors crisscross so much of our cities. And so they provide a network of places where we could literally infuse more nature into our built environments if uh, we were intentionally designing that way. This also opens up a completely different set of actors who have uh, opportunities to build programs, to send funding, and to work with communities through, for example, departments of transportation and highways, departments of energy and port authorities, who we don't usually think about as major actors for conservation in nature, but certainly could be. And in the private sector side, many firms are being hired to build this transportation infrastructure, construction companies, infrastructure companies, energy companies, all of whom make proposals and put together pitches that they decide what those include. And there are options for them to include nature as part of what is making these transportation systems robust to the conditions we live in now. These options have been recognized in many places and implemented in a lot of different contexts, and I want to share just one um, from the Department of Transportation that does have a long record of, in some cases, uh, building nature into their transportation corridor investments. Um, the, in this last year, the bipartisan infrastructure law created funding for a new program called PROTECT, which will receive $1.4 billion, with a B, dollars per year between now and 2026. And the entire focus of this program is to enhance the resilience of our surface transportation corridors in some way. That's the objective of the program. And the Department of Transportation recognizes and states in this program that nature-based solutions can help contribute to that resilience. So they qualify. You can propose nature-based approaches to bring resilience to our transportation infrastructure. That's a major potential avenue for investment in nature. I want to switch now to another perhaps less expected uh, avenue in for nature and cities, and that is through emergency management and risk reduction. As I mentioned, of course, we have increasing exposure to risks and disasters that we are increasingly intentionally preparing for and having to recover from. There are different agencies in different parts of cities that manage those processes, and we know, as we saw in some of the earlier examples, that nature can help reduce these risks from fire and flooding and heat stress and drought. And so there are opportunities now for emergency management authorities, fire units, and engineers to build nature in as part of their risk reduction strategies. And again, on the private sector side, all of these risk reduction options and resilience building options are being built literally by someone. And so construction engineering firms and even insurance companies have opportunities to incentivize and put forward options that build with nature. To give a couple examples of how this is already happening, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is our major federal agency that does help communities prepare for and respond to uh, disasters. One of their major programs is called Building Resilient Infrastructure in Communities. This helps communities prepare before disasters to reduce their risks and increase their resilience. And so communities can apply for these funds at any time. And uh, FEMA has been very forward-leaning on nature-based solutions and has allowed nature-based solutions in these proposals for many years. Last year, this program put out $3 billion in grants, and 50% of the projects that were funded included some kind of nature-based solution. So this shows very clearly that there's recognition at the federal level that nature is part of the solution that resilient communities need and that communities want it because they're putting forward proposals that have nature-based solutions embedded as part of what they want to invest in and build. This program will receive $1 billion this year and is, again, an open-door opportunity for proposals to support nature-based approaches. FEMA has another major program that's on the other side of disasters, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, that helps communities respond once a disaster has struck. So this is a, a different set of options, a different set of approaches, and a different set of funding. And this year, FEMA gave the first ever support to a grant on this side of their program that supports a nature-based solution. So they've now delivered funding to Puerto Rico, where a coral reef that acts as a barrier to a major uh, urban area that buffers storm waves uh, was damaged. 
and the FEMA funding is now helping that community restore and recover that reef, recognizing that it will continue to act as a barrier and buffer that community from the next storms. I want to switch to another example of where we can build nature into our cities, literally through buildings themselves. Many of you are probably familiar with green roofs, and now maybe you'll look at them more often, now that you know that they'll make you smarter. <laughs> There's also green buildings and green sites where we have global standards like LEED certification and sites certifications that helps us start to look at buildings and their footprints on the landscape as more comprehensive units that can more broadly embrace and engage nature. So with these options, we're again talking about a different set of entry points into cities through housing and urban development programs, city planners, water and wastewater management authorities, permitting offices, and again, the architects, landscapers, design firms, and construction companies that are building our cities. All of them have options that they could be putting forward where nature is much more embedded in the literal building design and construction that we uh, see grow around us. One example from the private sector side that I got to visit a couple of years ago is the Google Mountain View campus in the Bay Area. These are some very futuristic buildings with a lot of really interesting design elements. But what I want to draw your attention to is the landscape footprint and some decisions they made about managing the land that these buildings sit on. Um, this facility uh, was built with a large pond that you can see on the right hand lower side, but also several more extensive wetlands that were restored and constructed to manage all of the storm water from that site in place and all of the gray water from the entire production and use of those facilities. So, I understand that they had to go through a somewhat difficult and painful process with water permitting to do that, but they were willing to do it and push the boundary and bring nature into their site management process in a way that's benefiting the facility and the company in terms of management costs, but is also providing habitat. You can see the bay, San Francisco Bay, up to the upper right, right on a major migratory flyway for migratory shorebirds. So providing an embedded aspect of the landscape that's not fully recovering or restoring nature, but is providing an element that can help build connectivity in the system. There's also a little hard to see in this picture, but a blob of trees right between the two main buildings that's actually an island of oaks that are native. And this used to be an oak savanna landscape with oak islands that were a very typical feature of the habitat. And so they very intentionally designed the landscape to rebuild several of those oak islands and they're now engaged in region-wide strategic landscape scale planning to try and encourage their neighbors to do similar things and start to over time hopefully re-establish some of that more patchy natural habitat feeling that used to be what dominated the landscape. These approaches are also being invested in directly already by some uh, federal agencies. I learned myself in, in my current position that the US federal government owns and manages 300,000 buildings which is a lot, and so a lot of opportunities to lead with those built assets in what they look like and how much they embrace nature. And this is one of my favorite examples of how that's already been done. This is the US Coast Guard headquarters outside of Washington, DC, that actually has one of the largest green roofs in the world. And they also re-established uh, and restored some of the functioning parts of this environment and ecosystem Again, in this case, to help manage stormwater, you see the large stormwater pond. They also manage all of their stormwater on site and have restored several areas of native habitat that helps cool the facility and lower operation and management costs. So a very clear example of how we can adopt these kinds of options at scale in all kinds of different building contexts. Outside of managing the federal government's own buildings, the Agency for Housing and Urban Development is again one of our major investors in housing and urban development um, and has programs that provide funding to communities, especially for low income and resilient housing. One of their major programs is called the Community Development Block Grant Program. And that program also already recognizes nature-based solutions and allows proposals that include nature-based components of buildings. Uh, last year, that program provided $3.3 billion of funding overall. Again, not a small budget available for investing in what our housing infrastructure looks like. So with the last option I want to talk about and the last solution, I want to bring us back full circle to indigenous knowledge, where I started. 
The knowledge that P the Panan were willing to share with us very likely saved my husband's life and set me on a path of exploring these connections between health and nature all the way to the White House, where I did get to visit and roll Easter eggs with my family. <laughs> and uh, my son, uh, who's there, you know, potentially wouldn't exist as a human if the Panan weren't willing to share with us their knowledge about nature and health. And so on this path that I, that I have been on, I have learned uh, about the very, very broad and expansive relevance of indigenous knowledge to all aspects of our life. And many indigenous communities you know, work and live in very close relation with the natural environment. And there's much that we can learn about models for living and models for community um, from those perspectives and those very long experiences. I was very excited when the federal government last year reduced the first ever federal guidance on indigenous knowledge, which recognizes indigenous knowledge as an important form of evidence and directs agencies to consider it in all federal decision making. I think we can all take a card from that. Thank you. I think we can all follow that example and that suggestion and look for opportunities to um, build uh, relationships with indigenous knowledge holders, build more opportunities for co-management of the natural environment in our urban settings with them, and find opportunities to um, bring indigenous knowledge into our workplaces wherever they are and into our context in the urban environment, whatever that might be. So I want to start to bring us to a close so that I can hear some of your questions, so start percolating them. I want to appreciate that we're here tonight um, with all of these options and solutions and science to move us forward, building on much of what I understand Doug Walker lived for, an expansive love of nature and a real intention to help everyone have access to it. I've given you just a glimpse of what we've learned about how important that access to nature is for our mental and our physical and our emotional health and well-being. And I've introduced you to just a few of the options that we have and a, a huge range of opportunities to bring that information, that knowledge to bear in the way that we design cities. We, of course, have our bedrock foundation of parks that need to continue to expand and grow in our urban footprint and beyond it. And there's so much more. I've given you examples tonight that could touch almost every aspect of our urban communities if we want it to. So I feel that we are in an unprecedented time here with the emergence of uh, unexpected risks that affect us all more and more every day, and in many cases are literally wiping the slate clean of our communities and what our living environment looks like. And that means we have an unprecedented opportunity to bring different thinking and the information we know now about how nature can be more strongly built into our cities to bear as we make those decisions about what we build. So what will we build? That is the question. And I welcome you all now to fully engage in its answer wherever you live, whatever your community looks like, and to think hard about how we can do more to bring nature into those living environments and cultivate a much stronger connection between nature for your own sake, for the own sake of your health, and for the real possibility of building uh, resilient and prosperous communities in the future. Thank you. And now I'm happy to hear questions. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm high challenge too. So, um, I, you know, I've been a greenie virtually all my life, and I grew up in New York City, so it's sort of an interesting experience. Um, one of the things I noticed, and of course it sort of makes sense since this is slides about Western Washington in, some, in many cases, and what we see looks like could be Western Washington. I'm especially concerned about places where there really aren't trees and shouldn't be trees, like Phoenix, okay? The places that seem to have the greatest growth in the United States. Now, you're not gonna put up trees in Phoenix. I mean, you could put up um, 
trees that are native to Australia, but then people don't want to have trees that aren't native. These places, you know, the native green are cacti. So how are you going to deal with the fact that Americans seem to want to live in places where the weather is repulsive from about, oh, October through, no, actually the other way around, March through October. Of course, they think I'm nuts, but I'm here. Um, and basically, they're the, I think they're a greater risk than places like Western Washington, where people will actually plant trees and they will survive. Great question. So one thing I think it's really important to emphasize is that the kinds of nature-based solutions that I'm talking about, uh, I uh, don't suggest will fix all of the problems, right? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, part of the patterns that we're seeing and part of the intensification we're seeing is driven by climate change. That's not fixed wholly by improving the natural environment. It has to be fixed by other transformations that we know about. And so in some cases, though, I do really want to emphasize that what we're talking about here is recovering the natural environment, whatever it is supposed to be in the place where you're talking about. And so in places like Arizona, in the desert, there's native vegetation. Some of it can provide some cooling, uh, even on the form of, for example, green roofs, which might be more brown or yellow roofs there, but are natural vegetation that can still provide some cooling. So some of these solutions if you follow the ecosystem that you're responding to and living in, can still provide some of these benefits. In other cases, they won't. And so the point here is really just to use the evidence and the science and the information we have to uh, design effective options. When that can include nature, we should be looking at that first until we're sure it's not gonna be effective. Yes. I just wanted to comment on, and you talk about the need for parks in our cities. Um, I believe it's a lot more than that. We need trees where people live in neighborhoods, along streets, in uh, yards that we need to look at with the need for housing that we build up or look at ways to incorporate these. Otherwise, we're creating a lot of heat island impacts across the city. And I think uh, I'd like you to comment on that in terms of looking at not just parks, but looking at trees where people actually live because not everybody can go out into parks every day or they don't, they're, they're not able to. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's a very, very important point and um, one uh, I, I want to reiterate I think is critical um, to the option set that we have. Some of the things that I mentioned like gre uh, putting more natural habitat into transportation corridors is not going to be parks, right? That's our throughways, our thoroughfares, um, uh, many of the aspects of our, uh, our uh, distributed cities where nature could be more a part of the picture. I also mentioned housing and urban development specifically because those are the kinds of decisions that affect what our neighborhoods look like. Right? And there are many ways to think about building nature into the footprints of buildings, not separate as a set-aside park, but as a core element of what we're developing intentionally to create the community spaces that we live in. So many of these nature-based solutions do not need to be in a park. Right? They very intentionally are not in a park and give us options for how we can bring nature back into many of the components of the city, not just in sort of set-aside places that for some people are difficult to access. Please. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering because I've, I've done some studies on kind of the environmental justice impacts of greening and how sometimes it's, even when a community is engaging in their own efforts to rehabilitate their community, then they end up getting displaced and property values increase and they're pushed out. And I've been studying a little bit about the term just green enough where people are able to better their environments and, the, and get the benefits you were saying without the, the results of kind of becoming wider and wealthier. And can you speak to some of that marriage or that intersection in any of your work? Yeah, that's a very important point. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, I mentioned some of the health inequities that are created by differences in the quality of the environment where people live that's certainly repeated and replicated through all of the possible avenues that I mentioned. And as you point out, there's been a lot of really important research um, showing how greening areas can have very detrimental 
uh, and unjust effects in some cases. And so I think um, the main point is just that that's something we're aware of and we know needs to be part of the design processes when we're thinking about these approaches. Um, I will also say that that just green enough uh, aspect is really interesting and I think still part of a frontier of exploration in using a lot of these approaches where um, it's not always clear you know, how much of a certain uh, change in the environment you need to sufficiently reduce flood risk or to sufficiently uh, have a mental health improvement. And so both in terms of the justice effects and the potential health and other effects of a lot of these uh, approaches, we're still sort of titrating and figuring out what that response curve looks like, you know, what the different levels of investment will really lead to for the different social outcomes. <laughs> So thinking about the role of nature-based solutions and the role of our fantastic parks, uh, we have the benefit of wonderful, I guess, uh, Olmsted-style parks around here. But um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, um, in, I guess, in the context of nature-based solutions, but um, just in general about what does a good park look like? Do our parks change? Do they stay the same? What does our, this is in part inspired by a wonderful conversation with some great people down at uh, Seward Park was, um, is that we, is that sometimes we cannot leave nature alone. We, there is, there is management, there's opportunities to manage. I was wondering too, if you could comment on that a little bit, but also what role do our parks play in these nature-based solutions? Do they change? Do they stay the same? Do we need to change? How do we adapt, grow? Um, and evolve these wonderful green spaces that we do have so that they can play the role or maybe am I even misinterpreting the role that parks could play in our nature-based solutions? Great, thank you. Sorry, three questions. That's okay, I'll try. <laughs> I'll say some rambling long answer and I'm sure it'll hit all of the points. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, I wanna maybe have a two-part answer. One is, it's always up to us what parks are for. Right? and what they look like and what they're doing and what values they're meant to provide. And that doesn't change and shouldn't change. And I hope what this does is welcome you all more into that conversation. So what you think parts should be doing becomes more front and center in how they're actually designed and built so that communities are getting what they want out of parks. The second part I'll say is, I think we have um, conventionally thought about parks in pretty particular ways for a long time that provides some of the social benefits that parks can provide. And that's good and that's an important starting point. But now as we learn about the additional benefits that having nature around can have, we have additional information about how we can design parks differently so they provide more of those opportunities. So there probably aren't a lot of city parks that are designed for flood risk reduction. A lot of city parks are designed for recreation and outdoor opportunities. There's absolutely certain to be cases where you could design for both effectively and not lose any of the recreation opportunity benefits. Similarly, some of that could be true for things like heat stress reduction and some of the other things that I talked about. So I think what this um, evolution in our knowledge and thinking uh, could open up for us is a more broader thinking about what parks can do in cities and how they can be designed in a way that provides more of that full range of social benefits that nature could be bringing to us if, if that's what we choose. Please. Thank you for being present this evening. I have one comment and one question. Um, I was in New York City a couple weeks ago, and uh, when my partner's in meetings, I have other business to do throughout the city. One in particular, and very close to me, is Harlem. And I just happened to do a Zoom in Central Park. And as I was doing the Zoom, one of my peers mentioned to me the history of Central Park and how through eminent domain, a thriving black community at one time was completely released from that land, and now we have Central Park. So I bring that up because we need to know the history of why, when we ask people to come into these spaces, why there is some reluctance. The question I have is, I spoke to a group of college students at one of our prominent universities here in Seattle. <laughs> and the question came up, and I've been sleeping on it ever since. The question was, Mr. McBride, 
from everything that we have studied, from everything that we've experienced, from everything that we see and touch, we are losing hope. Hope to shift the needle of climate shift or change. What can you tell us about that hope? In my understanding, there's progressive and there's passive hope. And I just ask you that question. What would you tell those students who I believe is our hope, but they are losing hope, if I may? <laughs> I appreciate the question and the statement. Um, I keep going in all of this stuff because I see things that make me hopeful. And I share some of the examples with you all tonight because options and opportunities and real intention and investment in things that will make a difference are happening. A lot of it isn't visible, it isn't talked about, it isn't advertised, it isn't elevated. And I think we miss a lot of change is actually happening that gives me hope. So I think part of our challenge is making visible what is happening across the board, not just the disasters that are so easy to report on, the crises that are so easy to find on social media, but to continue to lift up and identify and talk about and push for the kinds of change that I gave some examples of here. You know, they may seem small on a project by project basis, but I'm blown away by the amount of interest and funding and support that's available now to do things differently if those ideas are brought to the table. So I am excited you're in a role in a prominent university where you can share those thoughts with young people who need to hear about them. And I, I welcome you all to do the same in your communities, in your coffee tables, wherever you are, to make sure you know a couple of those examples that are gonna resonate with people and mean something and be ready to say them whenever you can. Okay, I'm gonna take a last question here and then we're gonna wrap up. Hi, thank you. A uh, little bit of context, I'm studying landscape architecture and ecological urban design at UW. Great. So very much interested in this sort of work and looking to get involved and I'm curious how you see this progressing forward the most quickly. I think kind of bouncing off the last question, it's not necessarily about losing hope but we see how pressing the climate crisis is and a lot of young people want to see things implemented quite quickly because it is the future. Um, do you see this moving forward through large governmental institutions like the federal government where there is a lot of building and street ownership and there are funding for projects or but perhaps things get a bit bogged down or more so through private industry where you're kind of at the whims of your clients, but things are maybe a bit more nimble. And I'm curious, how do you kind of get nature-based solutions and ecological design on the ground in a, uh, like an ethical and like pragmatic way? Yeah, first, thanks for studying that. <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna just give the like unsatisfying answer of all of the above. Um, I really do think, you know, I have, uh, worked with universities, I've worked in the nonprofit community, I've now worked in the government, and it's just clear that every, every lever has to be pulled, right? Every avenue has to be run down uh, as fast as we can. And so pick your avenue. Um, I, I don't feel like there's one way these changes are gonna happen. Um, they have to be moving uh, in progression together in some way um, for all of the change to be unlocked at the scale and the pace that we need. So that just means, yay, you can choose whatever avenue of career you want and be sure it's gonna make a difference. I wanna share one other quick story as my way out, and uh, that is that I, I had the chance to visit Oklahoma this year, um, or maybe last year, recently, and I know <laughs> it was fantastic. And uh, I met a woman who's on a water board uh, in an area where a reservoir serves three major cities. 
And she told me a story about that water board having conversations and making decisions about uh, needing to make updates and improvements to that reservoir. And so they put out a typical request for proposals, soliciting the kinds of improvements that they were looking for. And they got in multiple proposals, multiple offers and pitches. And one of them included nature-based features. They didn't ask for it. And she said, I didn't even know they existed. And when I saw it, I knew that's what I wanted. And so the private sector has a huge role to play, which is why I was emphasizing some of those major entry points in. You know, there's not endless flexibility in what companies can put forward, but there is flexibility. And someone's making choices about what's in that pitch deck and what options are shown. And there's always an open door for part of that to be nature. So hurry up and get your degree, and then go draw lots of options that have nature in them. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heather, for that really uh, inspiring uh, and hopeful talk, which we all need right now. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. And we're grateful for your leadership at this time when solutions are so desperately needed and hope is needed. So thank you. Can we have one more round of applause? I know I'm going to be thinking about what I learned here tonight for quite some time. And I encourage you all also to enjoy uh, our local arboretum, which is where I go for um, inspiration. And it is uh, jointly operated by the City of Seattle and the College of the Environment. So I'm especially attached to it. But now I'm going to redouble my efforts to get there, because I need all the IQ points I can get. <laughs> so. I want to just briefly also say thank you uh, to Maggie as well. We're so grateful for the early work that you and Doug did in championing this kind of impo important work. Um, I <laughs> I also want to thank our advancement team, particularly Monica Cataldo, who's here organizing things, who is so organized. When I was backstage, she introduced me to her backup in case she broke her leg in the next hour. <laughs> and there's a team of volunteers and alumni and students who've been helping organize all of this as well. So thank you very much to them. I also want to thank all of you for being part of our community here and for coming tonight and uh, being part of this important and inspirational evening. Uh, if you uh, want to stay up to date about what's happening with the College of the Environment, uh, please go to our website and join our mailing list and you can uh, get our monthly newsletter and be updated on other events. Um, otherwise, I wish you all a good night and a safe trip home. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>